from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's hard to imagine anybody more deserving of uh, appearing here at the Book Festival than John Yardley. He spent a lifetime immersed in writing and literature. He was an editor, uh, newspaper editor, the Daily Tar Heel when he was at UNC Chapel Hill, fresh from school. He worked for the legendary New York Times Washington Bureau Chief Scotty Reston. He's been a book editor at the Miami Herald, was a book critic for the Washington Star, won a Pulitzer Prize for his criticism, came to the Post 30 years ago. He has two sons, Jim and William, both of whom are distinguished correspondents for the New York Times. He's married to the Washington Post's Maria Rana, former Book World editor, a critic, and one of the organizers of this festival. Um, he's, in other words, somebody who is deeply immersed in words, in writing, in literature. And he's probably best known these days for his wonderful, sometimes quirky, always engaging Sunday column on books in the Post's Outlook section. His reading habits and what he conveys are omnivorous. You will find reviews and occasional dissections about, on books on just about any subject. Not all of them new to bookstores, but nearly all of them new to readers or, or good refreshers for readers who may once have heard of them or once have read them. Um, his habit is to delve, and to delve deeply into the style, the motivations, the effects, the import of writing and books. He is blunt, he is entertaining, he is wise. He's written several books himself, among them biographies of Frederick Exley and Ring Lardner, and has published a memoir of his family, Our Kind of People. His most recent book is based on a series of columns he published in the Post called Second Reading, in which he looked back at notable or neglected books from the past that were worthy of a fresh glance. The book by this same title is well worth a primary read if you haven't seen it. So I now introduce uh, John Yardley. Thank you. It is no small honor to be introduced by the big boss. As Marcus was kind enough to say, I have published a number of books, seven to be exact. Um, I think of four of them as real books and three of them as collections, but I have to say that the second reading is the book that I am fondest of and I think proudest of. Um, the column began in March of 2003. Uh, I had, as some of you may know, I had written for about 20 years a column that had no name uh, that appeared on page two of the style section every Monday and was about whatever I wanted it to be about. And it was decided by uh, the editors of the style section that it was time for that column to move along and um, for me to do something else. And I, I floundered for a little while. I was still writing to, I was still a full-time employer employee of the Washington Post. I, I took the buyout uh, five years ago, and I now work on contract. But, but in 2003, I was writing a book review for the book world. I was writing a midweek book review for the style section, and I was writing the Monday column, which is actually a fair amount of work. Uh, and although the column was stopped, they still expected me to do more or less the same amount of, of, of work. Um, I floundered around for a while. I wrote a few longer pieces about books and so forth. But one day I was having lunch with Deborah Hurd, who had just become the editor of the style section, a person that I'm immensely fond of. And she was just very encouraging, saying, we want you to do stuff for the section and so forth and so on. And walking home, well, I, at the time I lived on Capitol Hill, and walking home from Georgia Brown's restaurant to Fifth and A Northeast, it suddenly occurred to me, what about an irregular column in which I go back and look at older books that I, for one reason or another, wanted to, to read again. And I sent Deb an email, and she said, oh, yes, let's do that. And so I did it for eight years until the last one ran on January 1st, 2010. Um, I could keep on doing it, but I think one of the important things in life is to realize when, when something has, has reached its end. And, and I think it was better to let second reading end when it was going well um, than to let it sort of fizzle out as the books that I wrote about became less and less interesting to me. I do look in my bookshelves and see 
a book, a Thomas Hardy novel, for example, think, ah, why didn't I get to that? And that will doubtless haunt me for the rest of my working career. As I say in the introduction that I wrote to this collection, there are 60, of the, uh, I should say 60 of the 97 pieces are in here. The selection was a collaboration between me and Kent Carroll and his assistant at, at Europa Editions. Uh, and I think that we did end up with the 60 best of those columns. Um, I, I realized as the, as the series began to develop some history that all unintentionally I was writing this uh, as close as I will ever come to writing my own autobiography. Um, my life is reasonably interesting to me, marginally less so to members of my family, and almost not at all to anybody else. It's, it's been sitting in chairs. Um, and um, there's been a certain amount of personal drama attendant to that, but that's uh, private linen that I don't care to wash in public and isn't all that interesting anyway. Um, but my life as a reader, which is what I do, I read. L last night there was a, uh, what, the, what is known annually as the gala, which is a uh, festivity in the, in the main Jefferson building of the Library of Congress, which is surely one of the most magnificent structures this country is proud enough to have. And all four of the people who spoke, um, um, Leon Fleischer, um, uh, Tony Morrison, Edmund Morris, and uh, Catherine Patterson, all talked in different ways about how much reading means to them. And I got to thinking as I was sitting there, uh, thinking about this book of mine, and that reading is what I do. It, uh, I have other passions, but reading, I, I'm one of those incredibly lucky people who has managed to make a living of sorts doing what he likes to do best. Um, the writing is a bonus. Um, but I read all the time. We, we now have a smallish apartment on Logan Circle. And uh, I sit in my very small office uh, with lots of bright windows and uh, my dachshund lying in his tuffet at my feet. And I just read all day, either in my easy chair or in my chair reading online. Um, I thought that by this stage in my career I would be retired. The plan, that the or original arrangement that I had with the Post was that, was that I would do four one-year contracts ending in at the end of 2010. But Marcus Brockley was kind enough to ask me to continue, and so I am at least through the end of next year and possibly further. But I have to tell you that one of the reasons that retirement looks so tempting to me is that I can read all I want to and I won't have to write about it. Um, because, you know, I've, been, I've published my first book review, professional book review, in the Greensboro, North Carolina Daily News in the fall of 1974. And it was, it was overreaching. My first book review was of Saul Bellows Herzog, which, of course, I didn't understand a word of. Um, but I've, I've been a book reviewer ever since, and I've written thousands of reviews. I don't know how many. And when you do what I do, you sit there. I'm sure everybody, some people m make notes in the margin. I sit there with a little Washington Post 3 by 5 pad, and I, I, make, I make little check marks in the, in the book. I'm usually reading from advanced galley proofs, bound galley. But I make little marks. You know, this is an interesting passage. This is bad writing. This is a theme that is worth, looks as though it's going to be central to the book. And so I would make little notes, and, and I will say, I may have at the bottom quotes, passages from which I would like to quote to give some sense of the author's style, what a book feels like. And so I might, by the time I've read the book, it's a 300-page book, I might have seven or eight page citations as po possible quotes. I might have, um, let's say, um, it's a book about a work of history about World War II. Um, I might have... Um, I might have uh, a number of citations about the concentration camps. Um, and so all the time that I'm reading, I'm also thinking about what I'm going to be writing about. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting way to read a book. I suspect that a, a graduate student reads a book in a, in a somewhat similar fashion. Um, but it's also a demanding way to read a book. You don't just sit back, put your, your feet up on the auto person, and um, um, and uh, read away. And
And I really have been, frankly, I've been really looking forward to reading in that way. But what I've discovered is now is that doing only one piece a week requires basically about two days of work for reading and writing, um, sometimes three, depending on the book. Um, and the rest of the time, I can read. And so I have been, I've been having the best time I've read both of Evelyn Williams' autobiographies, which were hugely popular back in the 60s, but I'm probably totally forgotten now. Uh, read a biography of Williams, um, started reading Lytton Strachey, read Eminent Victorians, read Queen Victoria. Um, I have, um, uh, ha I think it's Michael Holroyd's biography of him, Waiting to be Read. I, I'm, reading, I'm reading tons and tons about World War II, um, both for, for review and for my own pleasure, although I'm not sure that pleasure is the word. Uh, you know, you, I'm going to be 72 next month, and I can look out and see there are a few people here who face more or less the same problem. Um, and you know, you, you get to wondering, wait a second, how much longer am I going to be around? What's the point in learning something new? Well, there's always, you realize, even if you, if, even if you know it for two more years and then you're dead, you knew it for those two years, um, and it's, it's worth knowing. Well, I should talk a little bit about the 60 pieces that are in here. Um, they're, they're mostly very positive pieces. Most of the books that I've reread, some of them I've reread for more than the first time. I, I think I've read The Great Gatsby 10 times, for example. I've read Anita Bruckner's, uh, Anita Bruckner's Look at Me at least four times. Um, but most of the books, um, seen me, for the most part, even better. Um, I really didn't like The Catcher in the Rye when I was 14 years old, and I really, really disliked it when I was 68. Um, <laughs> it's a piece of juvenilia in every sense of the word. Um, and it, I find it absolutely appalling that high school English teachers forced it off on unsuspecting students. And it sold, it sold countless trillions of copies and has made the Salinger estate very wealthy, although where that money goes, God knows. Um, I was disappointed in William Styron's Lie Down in Darkness, um, which when I read it, I guess it, I had the good fortune to have a Neiman Fellowship at Harvard. It's a fellowship that's awarded each year to 12 journalists. And you, you go there and you study for, for a year with the understanding you may not take anything for credit and you're not supposed to do any professional work, although some, some do. But you are supposed to take one course as though you were a student and to be given a grade that's sent to the Neiman office to really to prove that you did something besides go and drink in Harvard Square. Um, and I took a course in William Faulkner, a graduate level seminar. And it was a complete eye opener for me. At the time I was the book editor of a medium-sized newspaper in Greensboro, North Carolina. So I was writing for Southern readers, and I really had never connected with Faulkner. Well, at Harvard, of all places, I connected majorly with Faulkner. I read everything, not just what was in the course, but literally everything. I wrote a, a paper. We were required to write a paper, so I wrote a paper about uh, Faulkner's treatment of black characters, which got me in to go down in Moses and Intruder in the Dust and other, well, in everything he wrote, really. Um, Faulkner led to other Southern writers, including William Styron, whom I read for the first time in the early 70s. And uh, at the time, Lie Down in Darkness absolutely blew me away, particularly the, the famous scene in which Peyton Loftus' father goes to the fraternity weekend at UVA and gets drunk, um, as everybody else does, um, and uh, misbehaves. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a haunting, appalling, beautifully wrought scene. Um, the first time I met Paul Theroux, uh, he was passing through Miami promoting one of his books and came out to my house for dinner. And Paul has, I think, a photographic memory. He quoted verbatim the very long epigram from, uh, I think it's Thomas Brown, that Styron uses to, to begin that book, I, I, a feat of memory that continues to amaze me. When I went back to it, it seemed to me overwrought. Uh, humorless, which it was not true of uh, Styron. There are parts in it, Seth, Sophie's Choice, that are very, very funny. Um, but sometimes rereading a book will surprise you. 
Um, I, later in this, this year, in November, I'm reviewing a book by a professor emeritus at UVA um, called On Rereading. And she talks about how books change and you change in the course of reading. You're, you're, for one thing, if, if you're reading Faulkner in school when you're 16 years old, you're clueless. Um, I mean, how many, how many of you had um, The Sound and the Fury forced on you in high school? Yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, it's still tough, tough at, se at almost 72. It's also incredibly rewarding. Um, you're not always ready for books. That certainly was true of me. I, I read, tried to read Elizabeth Bowen's The Death of the Heart because my mother loved it. And I loved Elizabeth Bowen. Um, and my mother was, of all people, the most, the greatest influence on me as a reader. She was always with a book. I, one of my most vivid memories, although it's not a vivid scene at all, in, in our, our house in Chatham, Virginia, where my father was headmaster of a girls' school, uh, in the corner of the living room of the house that the school provided for us to live in, there was a red damask wing chair. And my mother was there whenever she wasn't doing something. She was sitting in that chair reading. And she was a perceptive reader who never said to me, Johnny, you're not old enough for that book. Uh, and so I stumbled into some stuff. I mean, I was reading Steinbeck and people like that when I was 10 or 11 years old, and which was about the right age for Steinbeck, I might add, <laughs> um, as I say in this book. Um, but I remember, un unlike The Catcher in the Rye, I remember Steinbeck with affection because he was very important in my life for a very long time. And affection and gratitude. So as I say in this piece, which I, it's, I think it's about Cannery Row or Tortilla Flat, I can't, can't remember which. Um, it's not for me now, but it was for me then, and I remain grateful for what that book did to me at a certain point in my life. Um, there are other books like, like The Great Gatsby or Look at Me that just get richer and richer and richer every time through. Um, you know, that's the wonderful thing about books and about movies. You can never grasp it all the first time around. I bet I have seen John Huston's The Man the man Who Would Be King 10 times. And there's always something in it that I didn't see the ninth time. Um, and the same is true of, of a novel or a work of, of nonfiction. You can't, you can't suck it all in at, at once. Um, I think you do perhaps a little bit more when you're reviewing a book because you, that high level of concentration is required. But um, just as a casual, general reader, um, you leave undiscovered aspects of a book that you will discover at some later reading if you go back to it. I am a passionate believer in rereading, and the second reading series really taught me that. Um, and although I will be in whatever, however many years are left to me, I will be uh, reading books that I have not read before. And just last week I read Ian Kershaw's two-volume two biography of Adolf Hitler, which is not an upper, um, uh, but it's a magnificent book. Um, but I will be going back. I, I, for example, Marie and I have an apartment in Peru where we spend several months each year, and I have the Library of America Faulkner volumes, and I hope that when we get down there this winter, which is summer in Lima, that I will be rereading some Faulkner. Um, I, it, it's, it's, you, you look at Absalom, Absalom, and you think, well, whoa, that's a challenge. But it's, I suspect I will admire it even more the second time through than I did the first, and I'll probably understand it better. Um, I love taking questions. I love, go whenever I do finally step down completely from my job at the Washington Post, what I will miss more than anything else is the exchanges that I have with my readers. Um, you are the best newspaper readers in the country. Um, you don't have the provincial narrowness of the New York Times as readers. Um, <laughs> um, you're you're well-educated. Um, this is just a, if this if this is not the best book market in the country, it's the second best, and probably per capita, it's the best. Um, these are difficult times for books, as and God knows for newspapers. Um, you don't need to be told that. And I don't need to tell you 
what I think is going to happen to books in the future because I don't have the foggiest idea. I think they'll still be here, and I think that you will still be able to, to have a real book in your hands as opposed to an uh, e-book. Um, but um, people, the, the need to tell stories and the need to read stories is not going to go away just because we're in a new world. Um, be, they may be told in slightly different ways, but they'll still be told and they'll still be read. Um, but for me, the advent of the electronic age, the greatest benefit is that it has facilitated my conversation with my readers. It's so easy to do this on email. It used to be when I lived in Baltimore, I would I, I'd go to the paper once a week for a meeting in which the book staff discusses assigning books to reviewers. And I would take an early train, very early train from Baltimore, and go in and sit at a typewriter answering letters. Um, I, I came from the Washington Star, which folded, as you probably know, in the summer of 1981. And although the Washington Times eventually came into existence, the collapse of the Star, to all intents and purposes, made Washington a one newspaper town. And the Post had had, as the Times in New York has too, some problems with institutional arrogance. And it seemed to me that the one tiny contribution that I could make to um, re reducing that image in the eyes of the, the public was to answer my mail. Most newspaper people don't do that. So I would go in there and you know, I might have 10 or 20 letters waiting for me. And I would sit there and type. Even if you just say, thanks for your letter, it was good for you to take the time to, to, to respond to what I wrote, the person knows that you read the letter and that you care enough about him or her to respond. That means something. So now I do it by email. It's so easy. Uh, every email that comes in, unless it's insulting, or there are a few of those. Um, I mean, hey, do you people read the comments online? God. Try, try going to, 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 to the sports sites, the Na Nationals Journal or Nats Insider. I mean, the comments are unbelievable. And then no one edits them for language. And uh, I, I don't get too much of that, but every once in a while you get something that you just toss into the electronic trash basket. By and large, I answer them. So please come up to the microphones if you are ready with questions for me. I'm eager to talk to you. And you are the first. I think we may have some problems with the mic. Is there, is there somebody who can address the sound question? This one seems to be okay. Well, okay. Okay. Uh, I just had a question. You've obviously met a few of the authors of whose books you have reviewed. Does knowing the author, meaning the author, change your perception of the book you've read? As an almost inviolable rule, I don't review books by my friends or by my enemies. That's eliminated a lot of people. I can't review Ann Pyle. <laughs> I can't review Ann Tyler, for example. I can't review Taylor Branch. They were neighbors and friends of mine in Baltimore. Um, I can't review Jim Conaway or Chris Buckley here in Washington. Um, I, I really, you know, if I know enemy leaps to mind, there's some people who certainly don't like me because I've written very uh, stern reviews of their books. But um, there have been one or two exceptions. Um, I did know Peter Taylor. Um, I continued to write about him because I thought he was the most important unknown American writer. This was in the 1970s and 80s. And um, I, I have a good deal of it. Look, a book reviewer has no power at all. You may have some influence. I can't, if, the, if, if people did what I tell them to do, the book bestseller lists would look very different. <laughs> um, but I do think that my review of Peter Taylor's The Old Forest helped him move out of obscurity into the bestseller status that he enjoyed for his last several books. Um, I, I, I acknowledge that the last piece in the second reading collection is about Peter's um, collected stories, and I acknowledge in there that, in fact, I did know him. But no, as a general, as a general rule, I try very hard. The Post is actually pretty strict about this. I'm not sure how I feel about it. The British as you may or may not know, have a, a tradition of enemies reviewing enemies and friends reviewing friends, and so there's all sorts of bile and spite and, and back scratching, and, and I, I find it rather amusing. 
um, uh, but there is at least a pretense of ob objectivity in American journalism, and um, uh, we, we, we try hard to honor it at the Post. Yes, sir. I was interested in your comment that you have few people who are willing to sit down and listen to your personal history. I'd like to give you a chance to uh, reverse that. As a fellow uh, graduate of the Mass, I'm fascinated that you grew up in the world of faith and have been very active in the intellectual world of the present secular world. I'm grateful for my background as a man in the church. Mm -hmm. But it's been a long journey. Right. I'd be interested in your reflection on your spiritual journey. Uh, That's pretty big. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oddly and interestingly enough, my namesake is the great um, preacher Jonathan Edwards. Um, and both of my parents, my mother, Helen Gregory, and my father, Billy Yardley, were great, 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 great grandchildren of Jonathan Edwards. Obviously, the blood got thin by the time it got to me. Um, and from Jonathan Edwards through my father ran an unbroken string of Episcopal ministers, literally unbroken, that ended with a bang with my generation. Um, I have not made a spiritual journey. I am not a religious person. Um, I respect the people's faith. Um, I have to say that I have serious doubts about the beneficial effects of religion in, in the world, uh, particularly, of course, when you come to religious fanaticism. Um, I. I think in in my case, and I think it, I think my sister Jane may still go to, may still go to church. I don't believe that my sister Sarah or my brother Ben goes to church. I I got I, Marie and I wanted to get married in a church, and and Father Downing at um, uh, the church up on on the hill was kind enough to let us do that, even though we had both sinned in the past. Um, and I I just. I, I, am, I am not a churchgoer. Um, I, I will, the most important part of my spiritual journey, if you call it that, was for six years of prep school, sitting in every single day in um, uh, chapel and hearing the two greatest prose works in the English language, the original King James Bible and the original Book of Common Prayer. That's how I learned to write. Um, and th those are two absolutely magnificent doc uh, documents, and it, it appalls me that the Episcopal Church has turned, it, turned its back on them in, in the interest of, uh, I don't know what they call it, I call it um, watering down. Um, so obviously the, 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 the Episcopal liturgy has played an important role in my life. Um, you can't have sat through all those chapel services without absorbing something more than words even if by osmosis, um, but, but religion basically doesn't interest me very much anymore. Yeah. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, I was you. just curious what you think of academic critics like Harold Bloom, and if you can talk about if you have any kinship with academic critics versus journalistic critics. Um, we live in different universes. Um, you should go online to, if, if you know us, there's a wonderful website called Arts and Letters Daily, which every day fishes around through the, the world of serious commentary and um, pr provides links to um, pieces of interest, criticism, articles, and so forth. There's an absolutely devastating piece that's a, a pretty high up on that site right now. It ran in the New Republic, can't remember the name of the author, an absolute withering uh, devastation of Harold Bloom. Um, and, you know, acknowledging his strengths, but in effect saying that he's become a self character um, I can't read academic critics. I, I, the book is more important than the critic. Uh, that is not true in academia now. Um, I remember 
uh, back in my very early Baltimore days, around 1980, um, my former wife and I were neighbors with Leo Brody, who was then teaching at um, Hopkins, and was friendly with Stanley Fish, who was then teaching at Hopkins. And I remember getting into a screaming argument, at, fueled by uh, whiskey, um, <laughs> with, with Fish, who insisted that the Academy was the most important readership. I think the most important readership is right here. Um, and um, I, I despair of what academic critics are doing to criticism. I, 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 I mean, I grew up in the age of people like Alan Tate and, and Robert Penn Warren, and the so-called new critics. And, and those people actually were trying to interpret works of literature to an intelligent readership. The crit academic critics today are writing for other academic critics. That, do, that do, just doesn't interest me. I don't read it. I can't read it because it's written in absolutely execrable prose. There is a kind of inside vocabulary um, that I, I, I'm not quick witted, witted enough to give you examples of, but, but they're just these non words. Um, um, what's that wonderful? Um, can't think of it. Um, no. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not making, I'm not making any great claims for what I do. The Washington Post calls me a book critic. I think of myself as a reviewer. I think of myself as a glorified consumer advice provider. Do, do I want to read this book? Um, also, a, a very important function that a newspaper or magazine book reviewer provides is letting people know what's inside a book that they're never going to read. Getting ideas out there, getting information out there. You are in, uh, the book reviewer is in part a reporter. Um, finding out, reading a book, what matters about this book? What would my readers like to know about this book that will help them to understand it? Because how many, you know, how many book reviews that you read actually leads you to reading the book? Not many. But what that book review tells you about the book may in one way or another be of value to you. Um, yeah. Uh, sometimes I'll read a book and also listen to it, mm -hmm. compare, uh, particularly with the idea of the second reading. Do you ever go back listen to a, an audio book of something you're already familiar with to see if you pick up a nuance or two? That's an interesting question. I, I live in the city, so I don't drive anywhere. Uh, I like cars. Um, but um, I don't have drive time. Um, I also, out of much the same um, sense, I almost never go to movie adaptations of serious works of fiction that I admire because movies can't do what, what say, Fitzgerald did in The Great Gatsby. All of adaptations of that book have been flops. Well, I, I don't like the idea of this voice getting between me and those words because how that, what that voice sounds like. I know, I know, and believe me, I'm not knocking it. I know that, that audio books are hugely important to many, many people. Um, and if you're stuck in a car for four hours a day, I certainly would, you know, that's a good way to get a book. But um, it's, at least not now, it's not for me. I also don't do electronic books. Uh, my wife, bless her, gave me a Kindle two Christmases ago, and I took one look at it and put it away. Um, I, have seen, I have seen a book screen on an iPad, and it's very attractive. I gave her an iPad for her birthday a couple of weeks ago, so I may steal it sometime and give it a try. <laughs> Well, um, the Washington Post properly and understandably has, does not um, allow reporters or, or reviewers to profit personally from items that they receive as a consequence of their jobs. If you are a music critic, you can't sell the CDs you get, for example. So back when Marie and I lived on the Hill, and I was still a full-time employee, employee books, the publisher sent me books gazillions of books. Every day brought 20, 30, 40 books. And um, I had a, a used bookseller who came about every six weeks and 
wrote a check to a charity. Um, my, my alma mater at Chapel Hill got a lot, of, a lot of money as a result. I'm not sure that it's a charity anymore, if you see what's happening to its football program, but um, um, program, um, that, that's a euphemism. Um, incidentally, on that subject, read Taylor Branch's piece in the Atlantic this month about college sports. It's absolutely essential reading. You'll never watch another college football game again. Um, you'll have, you, there are better things you can do like watch the Washington Nationals who play for pay <laughs> and next year watch them. Um, oh, what do I do with books? Now, uh, wh when we move to Logan Circle, um, I asked the publishers to stop sending me books because we had nowhere to put them. Um, we, ha I guess we had about 3,000 books in the house and we trimmed, or more I guess, we trimmed it down to 1,500, 2,000. We gave a lot away. Um, I gave some signed books to my sons. There is a place that you might like to know about. It's called Books for America. Marie just stumbled into it accidentally. They have a, a, a store, I guess you call it, near DuPont Circle. Um, they will take books and either sell them or turn them over to schools, libraries, prisons, whatever. Um, and if you, if you paid for the books, you can take a tax deduction. Um, there are fewer and fewer places that are interested in, in used books. I was interested that when um, Books for America came to our apartment last month, we had just winnowed out about 200 books. We had no space left. They, they didn't take any of the reference books. Um, and I think the reason for that is references now online. I, didn't, I don't need a 20-year-old one-volume Columbia Encyclopedia anymore. Um, I may be a fool, but with my eyes wide open, I pretty much trust Wikipedia. And it's gotten better and better as it's gotten more carefully managed. Um, it's, it's interesting, the question of disposing of books. I think it was harder for Marie than it was for me. Um, I guess I inherited this from my, pa my parents. When, when the exigencies of life required them to get rid of something, even something that they cared a lot about, such as furniture, they just walked away. And I just walked away from a lot of good books. Every once in a while, I'll be writing a piece, and I think, oh, I better go look at that book. And I get to the shelves, and I realize it's no longer there. But um, I, I, in effect, gave a lot of books to that nice little bookstore up on uh, uh, East Capitol um, just to get rid of them. Um, so that's what I do. Yes, ma'am. for heaven's sakes. I do remember him with much affection. Well, he was a wonderful man. He was a colleague of mine at the Miami Herald who died much, much, much too soon. A good man. Uh, I look forward to I'm a great admirer of Graham Greene's. In fact, I wrote the introduction to the Penguin Classics edition of The Man Within, uh, which may, in a way, have satisfied my need to write about Greene. Of course, I've, not many people have seen it. Um, we have, in our apartment in Peru, we have the um, Penguin hardcover edition, of the complete works of Graham Greene, at least up to the point which is wonderful, um, smallish, hard, hardbound books with white paper dust jacket, dust jacket, a lovely uh, edition that's probably pretty hard to find now. I admire Green greatly. Um, I was doing a, a dog and pony show at Politics and Prose 
couple of months ago, and the question came up about the Nobel Prize. Uh, I think I had said in the course of my ramblings that by and large it has not gone to the best books by the best writers. And I, I mentioned my immense gratitude that it had finally this year gone to a writer who really deserved it, Mario Vargas Llosa. But I specifically, and some one of the people in the audience always says somebody that you really think should have gotten and didn't, and my immediate response was Gran Green. Yes, ma'am. Since writers can't assume that people have read the classics nowadays, have you noticed anything that would, re would replace, uh, like, the Aeneid or Shakespeare or Greek or Roman myths that writers generally can refer to? Mm, so, so writers who are... are when, when they want to make an, um, an allusion to something, um, Absalom, Absalom doesn't mean anything if you haven't read the Bible. Right, right. Um, that's an interesting question that, frankly, I've never thought about, so I cannot give you a very intelligent answer. Um, she's wondering if, if there are books of more recent uh, vintage than Shakespeare and, and Homer. Obviously, uh, Dickens, some of the classic poems, poets of the 19th century, um, maybe T.S. Eliot. Um, um, 20th century novelists. Um, maybe Joseph Conrad. Um, yeah, no, not all. That's not something I worry about. Um, I worry about writing a piece that people will enjoy reading. Um, I'm a very firm believer in the importance of a word that the intelligentsia hold in, in disrepute, entertainment. Um, we have an obligation to entertain you, not to be silly, not to be frivolous, but to give you something that you will read with pleasure. So I, I try very hard to write a review that will um, give you pleasure, that will tell you what the book is about, that will tell you what I think about the book and why, um, that will urge you to consider reading it or to stay away from it, um, and um, to fulfill my obligations to, to my employer to, to do my job as well as I can. I don't worry about close reading. I, I worry about good reading. I guess I have time for one more. Yeah. Yes, uh, about uh, Baltimore, your book, Middle Atlantic States. I taught a class. I invited people to read it. Uh, what do you think of Baltimore? Why did you leave? Well, I left because of one of those personal events that I'm, um, my life changed. Um, I have acquired to my immense gratification a new, a new bride. And it seemed right to start life over. Um, I miss Baltimore. I lived in Roland Park, which is sort of, Baltimore is Cleveland Park, um, and um, it's it's a great city, and I uh, it's it's had a lot of trouble and problems, and it's worked tried very hard to to confront them and overcome them. Um, uh, we Marie and I discovered that she had been living in Bethesda, and I had been living in even though it's within the city limits, Roland Park is really suburbia, and we discovered that we both really like cities. So we moved to the hill and then to Logan Circle, and we have loved both of them. Um, I, 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 go, I mainly go to Baltimore now to see the dentist. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> I was there this Wednesday for the, uh, the 
incredibly wonderful combination of a colonoscopy and an endoscopy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you all very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.